I realize we have put you through a true workout today. Not even those of you who are on stage, even those of you who are listening attentively and asking great questions. Um, something I just wanted to say, a point pointed out to me by a friend in the audience. Um, some of us have been speaking as if this is an MIT audience, and, and that really couldn't be further from the truth. We actually have this wonderful audience of people from many, many, many different institutions, including student activists uh, from really all over the globe, trying to figure out how they might build freedom to innovate movements within their own communities. And that's really important to think about as we sort of queue up this next session. Uh, the one way to look at this session would be that this is two folks from MIT taking a victory lap. Uh, and that wouldn't be a terrible thing because we actually feel really good about what we've been able to do. What I hope this next session is actually about is two of the folks who've been responsible uh, for some really interesting stuff that we've been able to do at MIT, explaining how they did it and how it might end up being a model that could be replicable at other institutions. Uh, so I'm really thrilled at this point to turn the floor over to uh, two dear friends and colleagues. Uh, Nathan Matias uh, is a doctoral student here uh, at the MIT Media Lab. Um, he studies governance in online communities uh, and uh, does an enormous amount of work uh, on making the internet a more pleasant, more just, and more safe place. Uh, Kate Darling is, uh, Dr. Kate Darling, uh, is a, uh, a lawyer, an intellectual property specialist, also a researcher on human relationships with robots, uh, and we are incredibly lucky to have her in our lab uh, as a friend and collaborator. I'm going to turn over this next session to the two of them, and uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Ethan. So you have three key words in what you just said. One of them was stretch, another of them was workout, and the third one was lap. We've been sitting in chairs all day. So before we take this inflection point moment and start thinking about what we might do, um, let's also take this moment just to stand up uh, and stretch. Get your blood moving, take a deep breath. Breathe in, breathe out. Excellent, if you want to jump, if you want to roll your shoulders, that would be excellent because it's time to move from listening and start thinking actively as Kate and I reflect on what's happened here at MIT. All right, you can sit down now, thank you. So far today, we've had amazing talks by people who've experienced legal challenges firsthand, and also by a lot of clever people who had a lot of clever ideas coming from their experience in uh, overlapping and relating areas. But often, those clever ideas aren't developed in isolation, and they're definitely not developed solely by people standing on stages. There are things that come from the hard work, community building, and as Peter said, diplomacy and negotiation of talking to person after person, going to meeting after meeting, uh, walking through open doors, and running up against closed doors of all kinds. And so as we share our story from MIT, what I'd like to do, as someone who often spends my time less standing on stages when talking about it, these ideas and more sitting at tables in conversation, I'd like to walk through some of uh, our story here at MIT leading up to the MIT clinic uh, and what it took to bring that together, not just uh, from a few individuals with smart ideas, but by a wider community that cared. And uh, then Kate will be able to share more about the details of what we can expect at MIT. I'm part of a research group that often does fairly edgy stuff. And I'm often one of the people doing the least edgy work. Uh, I study online communities, and I look at behavior online. And I have colleagues who are doing things like uh, 
floating balloons to take footage of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill because the government won't allow people to fly airplanes over them. Um, or colleagues who get visited by the FBI because they're hosting a mirror of WikiLeaks. And so I wasn't really expecting uh, in my first year at MIT to find myself in a situation where my uh, server was cut off from IP access and a publisher was uh, inquiring at, to MIT about why I was scraping all of this information. And for me, that was a pretty terrifying moment because it was coming on the heels of what had happened to Aaron Swartz. Uh, fortunately, there were MIT staff and faculty, people like Ethan, um, who jumped in and were able to prevent this research project from landing me into greater trouble. And through that, I started to learn about other students who faced similar problems. Over the last 20 years, students who'd hosted FTP servers with software, who'd faced legal challenges for that, students who did uh, security research on uh, the uh, transportation card system, students who'd uh, tried to make uh, video game development widely accessible and face challenges for those things, as well as you know, the everyday stories of uh, the less visible people who received these cease and desist and other legal challenges. And it seems like when we do work that is creative, when we do things that no one's done before, it makes sense that we're pushing against the edges of reactive systems like law, which are there to watch and observe and react to new problems and challenges in society. Uh, and we have this tension where we want to foster really great and innovative work, whether, sure, it's in the like, commercial world, we can talk about startups, and also innovative work in, for social good uh, as we try to rebalance power and use words, use technology, use whatever tools we have at hand to create a just society. And here at MIT, we've had this ongoing challenge where students doing that creative work have faced difficulties from the law. Over the last few years, we've been able to successfully advocate for, and uh, folks at MIT have put in place this remarkable legal clinic that can help a small group of people, people who are at MIT, and we're very proud of that. Uh, but it didn't just start with the advocacy that we did. So as I tell this story, I want to start much earlier. So I've talked about the culture of creativity, but there's, and that goes back for a very long time at MIT. Um, and it's important as we, you know, one of the basic things that we can do is encourage each other to do work that is interesting and innovative. There's also a history of support. Um, there are people like Hal Abelson, like the dean of MIT who put on the jacket of batteries, who've consistently over the years uh, supported students when they got in trouble. And even at times where it's not clear what to do or what uh, the systemic responses are, this commitment to supporting students has been a common theme throughout MIT history. But sometimes that fails. And uh, I think I certainly, and I know a lot of my colleagues at MIT uh, were shocked and uh, in some cases paralyzed by the, the deplorable treatment that Aaron Swartz received and the role that MIT played in that. And one of the, I think, coalescing moments for us after uh, he ended his life was the report that Hal Abelson put together investigating MIT's role in this. And Hal put, put in huge amounts of work interviewing people across the institute, but also bringing in that history of cases, drawing from his knowledge as a faculty member to say actually this, this issue and this one person's story is profoundly important and valuable. And it's also part of a broader pattern of problems that we faced at the Institute. 
And as students, we read this uh, report with uh, sadness and disappointment. And also, at least some of us wanted to figure out what we could do to change this. And the first thing to do was to talk. Uh, firstly, in gatherings that we held at MIT immediately after Aaron's death, as people processed and made sense of what that meant and could mean. And then later on, after Hal's report, to say, OK, we, we see that there are problems here. We see that there are needs that students have that are systemic needs. What are we possibly going to be doing? And over the period of several months, actually, uh, we met regularly and talked about all sorts of things, uh, maybe a group of about a half a dozen students. And we talked about culture change in the institution. We talked about what could professors do to better support student creativity. We talked about administrative policies and challenges that students face when they, when they do edgy work that sometimes uh, gets interpreted or understood incorrectly. What could be done with education? There are like multitudes of possible directions that we could have taken. And as Peter said, uh, an important step for us was to find a community. Uh, as we talked about ideas, as we discussed what could change at MIT, uh, we also invested time in reaching out across the institute. And we made sure to remember. I, I still remember how generous uh, people like Starr and others were to talk with us and tell us their stories and help us understand as people who hadn't gone through this experience but were trying to prevent these problems in the future to help us understand what is it really like? What are the things that would most help someone in this situation? Lest we get caught up in kind of the passion of our ideology um, in a way that uh, draws us away from the very real needs of the people we're trying to serve. And then we tried stuff. Uh, we didn't necessarily know what the right or best or most possible thing to do was. But there were some things that we could do. For example, um, about five four, four months after Hal Abelson's report, a number of us convened a coders know your rights class for students. Uh, it's actually kind of a small thing. We took an afternoon and invited people from anywhere in MIT to join a session led by actually some of the amazing people you've already heard on stage and will hear on stage talk about what are your rights as a coder, as a researcher. We talked about terms of service and research. We talked about scraping. We talked about copyright, DMCA, and listened to students across the institute uh, tell us their ideas about what they thought the risks were and help overcome some of those misconceptions. And through those outreach efforts, through things like that class, we started to get a sense for what the common challenges might be. After uh, Hal's report, the MIT administration committed to a hearings process to listen to people across the institute uh, share their reactions and proposals for how MIT might change how it worked. So we realized there was a key opportunity to collaborate with the administration and share some concrete ideas. And finding something to focus on was incredibly important, especially um, as in the early days, uh, we didn't have a lot of capacity to try many different approaches. Um, and what we settled on, building on uh, the class and what we'd learned from our other conversations, was this idea of uh, a legal tri triage, a, a single point of contact that students could go to that would offer them support, advice, uh, someone who could really be on students' side when something went wrong, as well as someone who could be proactive to offer education and support throughout the institute to help MIT students better understand uh, what their rights and responsibilities and risks could be. And that required us to find allies. One of the, the most time-consuming things for us as a small group of about a half a dozen people was to scour MIT 
uh, email all sorts of faculty, staff, people in the administration. Some of them answered our emails. Some of them welcomed us and said, I've cared about this and I'm so glad you're doing it. Others uh, regarded us with suspicion. Like it was a fraught moment. Um, people weren't sure what they felt about um, uh, Hal's findings. They weren't sure what that meant for the institution. They weren't sure whether they should be defending MIT from public embarrassment. They felt besieged. Some people felt like um, they were at risk if they spoke out on these issues. What would the administration think of them? Um, not all of these concerns were like grounded in reality, but it was so hard in a moment of like deep emotional uh, pain uh, and fear for people to uh, recognize the benefits of acknowledging problems and tackling them head on so that we could actually make progress. My hope for all of you is that in your institutions um, that uh, improvements in support for student innovation and creativity and other legal risks that student might face won't be prompted by such a traumatic and horrible thing, firstly for Aaron and his family, um, and uh, such a fraught issue, at least intellectually and in terms of like reputation for so, so many people across MIT. Hopefully, you won't be in that context of uncertainty. Uh, but that was the reality for us. And it was in that context that um, the Tidbit students received their subpoena. Uh, and uh, around the time that we were forming our ideas for this legal triage system, and um, I'll admit that, and I actually want to ap apologize to the, uh, Jeremy and the others at Tidbit for not responding sooner. Um, we were so, at least I felt like I was so focused on putting this thing together. And I couldn't possibly imagine that after Hal's report and increased discussion on like the need to support students in these situations, that I couldn't possibly imagine that there, there was as limited support for the Tidbit students as there was. And in fact, it, it was in a meeting with Hal as we were working through the, uh, the proposal idea that we got a call from the AFF basically saying, is MIT doing anything? Um, can, like, what can you do to support these students? And that was time for us to organize. And we realized that there was a very real need for the students uh, behind Tidbit. And there was an increased need for us to make the case that supporting them and students like them was important. Uh, so uh, together with Hal and Ethan, we created a petition. Uh, one, uh, one uh, I suppose, benefit or advantage that we had is the number of us are very active in uh, student affairs across MIT. And so we had a pretty good knowledge of like which mailing lists. I realize this is like a, such a nitty gritty detail, but for those of you who are like student activists, like knowing who to talk to, like talk to the people who organize the parties and who everyone knows and who has like all of the email lists because they're the most capable people to like mobilize students if organizing and mobilizing is something that you need to do to create change. And in this case, we created a letter to uh, President Reif uh, asking him to uh, take concrete steps to support these students. And uh, I'm happy to say that the president responded incredibly swiftly. Before we'd even finished collecting signatures, he published a statement online and pledged not only support from MIT to uh, uh, support uh, Ruben and the Tidbit students, but also support for uh, the creation of more wide legal services for students. Uh, so, well, I'll come back to this question of collaboration. Um, over time, we found that people across MIT cared about what happened 
uh, to the Tidbit students, and they cared about these wider issues. And there were a number of other moments where we were able to mobilize together with the advice and guidance and help of uh, the legal counsel for the Tidbit students over at the EFF, uh, we were able to mobilize people within MIT and the alumni community to offer their support. In the meantime, uh, there was also a lot of work to take President Reif up on that promise. And a number of the people who'd been part of the group that was meeting uh, uh, for months, really, before uh, the Tidbit case, we're able to further build on the proposals we'd made and offer advice to MIT administration, who did a good job of working together with us. And, and, to, and I think often when we think about maybe activism and advocacy, um, and movement building. We think about kind of building enough pressure so that we finally convince the people in power to do something and create a particular kind of change. But even once you get to the point where you've convinced someone with influence and power to do something, there's a huge amount of work to actually uh, turn that into something real. Uh, Kate will be able to share more about that as someone who is deeply involved in it but there are a few comments I have about that process as well. Uh, if I had thought that it took a lot of time uh, and a lot of shoe leather to meet with people across MIT to build support for this idea, it also took vastly more time to meet with people across MIT to understand how do people from the library system think about this? How do people in entrepreneurship or the business school or the uh, different scholars who study law, or how do people in computer science and the media lab and media studies and people who study activism, how do different student societies think about it? What are the challenges that they face? And it took a lot of effort and shoe leather to consult with those people and put together something that uh, we felt uh, actually had the buy-in and interest from across MIT. And that's why it's important to endure. Um, there are those moments, as Peter said, where you're really not sure. There were definitely times where uh, there were months in between communication with people who had influence and power. Uh, and finding those ways to persevere in the things you care about are often essential for creating the change that needs to happen. Kate will be able to share more about the legal clinic, but I also want to reflect on the things that we'll be talking about here. I know some of the people in this room are students at universities, so you'll be asking, what is my university doing and what can it do better? Some of you are advocates who are asking questions about what is the legal context and how can we change those laws? Some people, uh, some of you represent uh, the really amazing uh, NGOs that offer legal support or try to coordinate and organize people on issues like this. And there are a few things that I, I've learned from this process that I'd like to share as we go into this brainstorming process. To mirror what Starr and Jeremy have said, um, this question of the uh, like really the psychological threat represented by uh, challenges to our freedom to create and innovate is very real. Whether it's the chilling effect that uh, prompts my fellow students to say, I'm not going to do that kind of research. I'm not going to try this project because I'm really worried about what could happen to me. That's a very important thing for us to figure out how to address. It's also important for us to think about the ways that we can support the people who do face these legal uh, challenges and these legal threats. Uh, Jeremy has spoken far more eloquently than I can about some of the mental health challenges, as has Star. And I think it's important, even as we think about systemic uh, changes and systemic things to address, what policies can we put in place? What rules can we tweak? How can we change the system? There are things that each of us can do if we're only willing to be attentive and vigilant 
to the needs of the people around us and willing to rally around them and also willing to be known as the kind of person that people can come to when they have these problems. I find myself really inspired by uh, the work of Chilling Effects and Wendy Seltzer's work to document these problems. I think a common challenge that all of us will continue to face as we advocate for better support for uh, not just students, but like creative tinkerers anywhere, uh, is the question, is this a problem? And what exactly is the problem? So I think there is an opportunity for us to think about how we can better document these things. At MIT, we were able to point to a history of high profile and maybe less profile cases that are part of this institutional history. As we think about doing things in other contexts, it's going to be very important to do that documentation. And it's important to organize and think about how best to organize in ways that support change in our institutions and more widely in society. And finally, there's an important question to be asked about what do we mean by freedom? Uh, as we went through uh, the process of negotiating uh, the uh, law clinic at MIT, we, we benefited from the fact that uh, technology creativity is linked with entrepreneurship and all of these, all of these values surrounding uh, like the generation of wealth and profit. And those are incredibly important things in society. But as someone who does research with activists, as someone who is dedicated to work um, for the social good, even if it's not profitable, uh, it's important to acknowledge and support people who are doing uh, important work that may not be generating money. And whether it's the uh, activists who use drones to uh, monitor uh, environmental disasters, or whether it's people who are uh, like doing information security stuff to support people who are calling power accountable. And uh, as we think about uh, this question of freedom for whom, it also goes beyond just uh, you know, freedom for people who want to do companies. It goes beyond just freedom for people who want to do the important work of civil society. It also uh, demands of us that we ask, what can we do outside the walls of universities, especially at a time when so much of the creativity and so much of the change that we see in society isn't coming from smart people inside of beautiful buildings like this, but is coming from grassroots creativity, from like kids who make an app to monitor uh, police violence, or from people who use social media to organize for change or um, uh, citizen groups who decide to start monitoring local rivers to uh, detect uh, environmental risks. These are not always things that start in privileged places like these universities. So even as we celebrate this moment uh, that's been achieved here at MIT and look to our own future in ways that we can improve, I'm really excited to learn from all of you about how we can do more to support and protect uh, creativity in the public interest uh, going forward. Thank you. Hello. Am I on? On. I'm on. Well, so uh, it's time for some real talk. <laughs> How did we get to this clinic? Um, I think there is some political nuance in how we got here that is worth sharing. And Joey alluded to some of this this morning when he was speaking. And I'm going to be a little bit more explicit about it. The main reason that we have a clinic right now 
is because the Martin Trust Center wanted an entrepreneurship clinic. The Martin Trust Center, as some of you know, is a center at MIT that helps student startups. Uh, it wanted a, a clinic that would help these startups that are spinning out of the institute um, incorporate their businesses, file for patents, deal with all of the kind of transactional law issues that come from starting companies. And you know, I think that's an awesome thing, and I think that's really great, and it's wonderful that MIT um, has this, but it has very little to do with what we've been talking about today. And an entrepreneurship clinic is not going to help Jeremy or Star or any of the other cases that we've had in this context. But that is the agreement that was made between MIT and BU. That is what they agreed on before we, the activists, ever got involved in that. And all we did basically is slide in under that door and talk to BU directly and say, hey, you guys, actually it was women, um, you know, would you be interested in expanding this clinic and you know, doing something for the students who get in trouble in the course of their research or you know, in the context of hacker culture at MIT? And fortunately, BU was awesome and they said, yeah, we'd be really interested in doing that. You know, how about we just tack on a second track to this clinic? Now, the reason that this went through then on MIT's side as far as I can tell, is because people with significant clout at the Institute, people whose names rhyme with Moe Mito, pushed for this to be approved. <laughs> Thank you for the laughter. You know, Joe Ito, Joe Ito put his name behind this cause and he pushed for this to be approved and as we found out this morning, he also got stuck with the bill for it. Um, but that's, that's how these things work and I am incredibly uncertain that any of our other efforts were listened to or acted upon by the administration. Um, and there were many efforts. I mean, Nathan talked about a lot of the student effort, but there was more. There were people raising concerns all across MIT. There was this legendary staff meeting where Tim Berners-Lee and Richard Stallman showed up and talked a bunch. And I don't know, are any of you on the CSAIL mailing list? Yeah, so there's a mailing list. That, I'm not even in the CSAIL department at MIT, but I'm on this mailing list because Richard Stallman is on it and he always responds to everything and it's kind of hilarious. And I, I recently mentioned to a friend of mine, I was like, you know, RMS really needs to pick his battles. And my friend was like, oh, he does pick his battles. He just picks every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I digress. I, the, the point is a lot of concerns were raised across the Institute you know, since the Schwartz case and uh, there's been no public recognition of these concerns and there's been no public recognition of the issues that the second clinic track is trying to address. The clinic was announced, I read the announcement, I didn't see any of that in there. That would have been a pretty good time to say something but someone at MIT decided that that wasn't gonna be part of the announcement. And I think that we should take note of that. Now that said, I am incredibly grateful to MIT for making this clinic possible. And I would really like to thank, from the bottom of my heart, Joey Ito and our provost, Marty Schmidt, for making this a reality, especially now that I know that Joey's paying for it. Um, so, you know, thank you to the, the people who had the power to make this, make this real. And I think what we, what we should be focusing on, we as in we at MIT, is you know, turning this clinic into something real, making sure that it is the best possible resource for our community, and for me, most importantly, making sure that it is a place at MIT that has students' backs when there's trouble. That is something that is very important to me and that I will continue to fight for in this context. Oh. So uh, where we are now, um, the second track of the entrepreneurship clinic is going to open in a year, next fall, and BU is currently looking for a director for this clinic track. 
And I think that it's going to be incredibly important, um, the, the person that we hire to direct this track, because they are going to shape um, the, the way that you know, these freedom to innovate issues are handled. And um, so I would urge all of you to reach out to your networks and let them know that you know, we're looking for a director. Please apply if you're qualified. And I would really appreciate it if you could spread the word. And as for the details, you know, I'm happy to take any questions that people might have about the clinic. I don't know how much time we have left. We definitely have time left. Um, let me just say, um, for any of you who were worried that this was going to be a victory lap on our part, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we, uh, <clears throat> it's probably better to be honest about these things. Uh, and that even in a case where people have worked really, really hard and we've gotten something that I think we're deservedly proud of, uh, it's complicated. And every step of it has been complicated. Uh, and almost every one of the victories uh, that people end up winning in these sorts of fields uh, end up complicated in these same sort of ways. Those complications aside, um, Kate, Nathan, all the other people involved with this were able to get something uh, really terrific um, out of some of the situations that we've been working our way through. I do think there's great questions to ask uh, both Kate and Nathan about the details of what we're trying to do with BU uh, and also sort of tactically uh, how we got here, how we got uh, what we got uh, and, and what we didn't get. And, and